Hello YouTube, this is the Booty Warrior, and welcome back to StarCraft 2. I'm going to be trying to do something a little bit more educational today. It's more than I usually do. Now, I know that there are people that watch my videos that are like low-level StarCraft players. Some of them are like trying to actively improve, and I never really go into too much detail over how I improve. I don't really get into the nitty-gritty. I'm going to try to do that a little bit better now. As best as I can. Uh, admittingly, it's like 1 in the morning, so it's not going to be perfect, but uh, before I get into the macro side of things, I just want to go ahead and introduce the units and try to explain how the, the general interaction of these units works out, right? I think that's a good starting point. Some people would argue that compositions aren't something that you should worry about when you're starting out, and yeah, like, it's more important to, like, know how to spend your money, but... If you want to get far in StarCraft rank system, I think, you might as well learn the most efficient methods of, like, defeating your opponent. Don't over-obsess over counters, but it's still worth keeping in mind. Because, I mean, let's be honest. Like, yeah, you might play against a Zerg player that is so bad at macro and bronze league that you can just kill him with marines, even if he only makes banelings. But, I mean... At a certain point, it gets to be a little bit too volatile, you know? And you, you want to try to work around that if you can. Like, Widow Mines or Siege Tanks or something. Or if you're Zerg and you're making nothing but Zerglings against someone who just makes Hellbats. That also have Blue Flame. You, you gotta calm the fuck down at a certain point, alright? Now, I'm gonna try to cover all the matchups. PvP, I... Admittingly, I have more knowledge of PvT and PvZ. Keep in mind, I have not really played Protoss for a while, since I believe like a year ago, whenever my last Protoss video was, and they did change Protoss a little bit. And to be honest, I don't even think all the changes are represented in this particular unit tester, but regardless, it's like a good general concept thing, because um, no matter how much StarCraft changes, usually the general interaction of units stays the same. Now let's start off with the most basic units of the game that you start off with is Protoss. Zealots and Adepts and Stalkers and Sentries. Alright. Now, start with a Zealot. Decent early game unit. You don't want too many of them in the early game, but if you do want to get, like, some units to defend yourself, and you don't want to, like, get rid of your gas or anything like that, like, let's say you want to save up your gas for tech, or like more expensive units. Zealots are a good mineral dump. The thing is, like, they get better in the mid to late game as soon as you have... charge. See how much faster that is? And the important thing about Zealots is, like, they force your opponent into an awkward position. Because your opponent will have to either get splash damage to deal with the Zealots, or... They're gonna have to, like, kite or something like that. They're good against Zerglings, they're good against... They're not really good against Banelings, but they don't trade as awfully as Marines do. Like, they can tank a few. Let, let's check it. Let's get, like, four Banelings to start off with. Let's try one... Two... Three... Okay, it's five Banelings. Now compare that to a Marine with Combat Shield, just to make this more fair. Okay, that's two Banelings to kill one Marine. The point is, it doesn't fucking matter. The point is, Zealots trade better into Banelings than Marines do, and they're not awful against Banelings. Of course, if your opponent has a lot of Banelings, that's a fucking problem. But if there's just a few, it's not the end of the world. So Banelings are more so to, like soften up the army of Protoss, rather than just annihilate it like it is with Terran. Or even Zerg. Like, if you have only Zerglings or anything like that. And you can use, like, Archons to, like, tank the Banelings and try to offset that a little bit, but, eh. The main purpose of the Zealot is to, like, be a good mid-game unit. Um, it's aggressive, it deals a lot of damage when they get on top of units. They're decently tanky. They get a little bit better as soon as, like, upgrades kick in. Early game without any upgrades. They're not that great. But, yeah. Now, let's get rid of that and talk about the, the Stalker. 
I personally really, really like making stalkers early game, especially against Terran. And I would argue you want either you want a sentry or you want at least one stalker against Zerg to like, you know, deny scouting with overlords and shit like that. Uh, against Terran, stalkers are good for denying liberator harass, assuming you don't lose them, of course. Gotta be careful about that shit. In fact, let's see, let's get a liberator out just for the purpose of discussion, right? Liberator has a little bit of time to set up. Let's see how many shots it takes. Two, three. Okay, it dies fucking fast. But it takes a while to kick in. So you can get like right behind it, force it to move out of the way. Usually, they're gonna be behind mineral lines. So whenever, you, you know, I'll get into that, like how to deal with that situation. But the point is, you use the stalkers to deny medevacs. You can snipe medevacs with it as well. Especially if you have blink enabled. So you can just snipe it like that. While the zealots absorb the brunt of the damage. And you know, you can catch them as they're trying to run away. Of course, stalkers aren't the only units that can deal with medevacs, but they're probably like one of the most obvious and straightforward ways to deal with a medevac. Which you're definitely going to need if Terran is going for bio, or if you want to deny drops and shit like that. And against Terran, other than sniping medevacs, other than preventing liberators from like just harassing mineral lines, not really that great against Terran. Um, Having some stalkers to deal with marines is okay, but the thing is, like, one marauder can add so much extra DPS, and I'm pretty sure at a certain point, like... Okay, let's get... Stim enabled, to further illustrate my point. That's better. At a certain point, that the marine DPS, especially when they're, like, focus firing their units, it gets to a point where, even if you technically don't have Marauders, like, the Marines just out-trade the Stalkers, just based off of upgrades and late-game scaling. Now, if we just add in a Marauder here, or even, like, two, you can see how different this experience is. It's, like, even less close. Okay, we're barely losing units as Terran. So, against this, what you want is, like, let's say, 10... Zealots and like an Archon mid game. I'm pretty sure this will trade. Well, I might want to add a few more. Let's see. Let's say two Archons. You can see that the Zealots are going right past the Archons. You don't even lose that many Zealots as a result. And that's the strength of the Archon, which I will get more into later. Let's clear it out. Let's go back to the Adept. Let's start the Adept, rather. The Adept has this trick where it can, like, go into a little shade. It's usually used for, like, scouting and harassing. But it can be a decent, like, early game defensive unit, especially against Zerg. Um, pretty good against Marines. I would not recommend getting too many of them against Terran mid-game, because I feel like Zealots are more efficient in terms of, like, being a mineral dump. Because, you know... You want Archon Zealot against Terran Bile, generally speaking. That is the go-to strategy against it. It can be a little bit different if Widow Mines are involved, or to an extent Siege Tanks, but generally, if, it, if it's just Terran Bile, Zealot Archon is the go-to response. And, you know, if you have tanks, you can build Immortals to counter the tanks, and shit like that. And uh, there's not too much to say about the Adept, honestly. It's a pretty simple unit. And after that, let's go for... Yeah, let's explain the Archon. This is like the big beefy unit. It's kind of like the Ultralisk, but better and actually good. <laughs> okay, it's super fucking tanky. It has splash damage. It deals extra damage to biological. So it's really good against Terran Bio. It's really good against Zerg in general. Um, I would say, regardless of your composition, Archons... You don't want too many of them, but... It's good to have some in your army. You know? Because generally... You want more High Templar than you want Archons. 
You know, so like, don't get greedy and be like, oh, I can just tilt kill Terran with only Archon Zealot. Like, nah, that, that's not as consistent as getting some Psionic Storm. And as far as like the interaction against Zerg, they're gonna get Tigers, they're gonna get Zerglings, they're gonna get Mutas. But once again, like, you still need Storm to offset some of it because, like, Protoss units are good, but even in like Wings of Liberty and Heart of the Swarm, like, Splash damage is really fucking important in this game in general, honestly. Especially for Protoss. Observer just scouts shit. It can detect invisible units. There's not much to say there. Warp Prism has... I believe this has the upgraded range in this mod, right? Yeah, it does. So it makes it easier to, like, pick up units. You can, like, micro... Let's see. L let me try, like, a, a classic trick. Okay, let's try... First off, let me check and see. I'm not sure who wins this 1v1. It might be the Roach, it might be the Stalker. Okay, Stalker actually beats that. But it outranges it, so what you can do is like... Kind of cancel out some of the damage. Like right before it goes through. But, let's see how this works. Okay, what was the hit range? 54? see. It's kind of hard to judge because, like, the fucking shields regen so fast. Let's say 54, alright? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like you can prevent damage from going through if you collect it, like, right before the animation connects. And this is something that pros do often, especially with, like, Immortals or Archons or Disruptors, you know, units like that. Especially in PvP. You might... Equivalate this... You'll say it's like equal to doing Reaver Micro with like a shuttle in Brood War. Although it's a lot easier. Because of the range. And... You could say that it makes the drops a lot easier for Protoss. Not as good as Terran drops, but it's... Something. You know, and you have Mass Recall as well off your Nexus, which helps a lot. Immortals, not terrible against Hydras. In fact, I want to try to demonstrate this. So let's get an Immortal out. It deals extra damage to Roaches and Armored Units in general, but it's not terrible against Hydras. Alright? And I'm pretty sure it got buffed between, like, Heart of the Swarm... And uh, Legacy of the Void. Because the shield... I don't know, it just triggers faster. But at a certain point, like, too many light units will eventually beat it out. Now, let's see how that works against the Marines, for demonstration's sake. <coughs> okay, that's with Stem. Let's see how it works without Stem. Like, how many shots does it take? One... Two, three, and then one, two, if they're stemmed. So not awful against Marines. Uh, they deal a shit more damage to the Marauder, obviously. So they're more efficient if you're seeing a lot of armored units, a lot of mech units, a lot of roaches, or even ultralisks. Uh, let's get a couple more immortals out. against just two ultras. Especially if they're focused firing. Like, you don't even have to really micro them. They can just kind of front off the damage. And this is like a subtle thing that I want to point out. Not too many units have it, I don't think, but... You can see the little turret is like maintaining contact with the ultra as it moves backwards. So, like... Whenever it's time for it to attack, you can do it a lot faster. And it will hit instead of having to, like, rotate its turret or anything like that. And... Actually, I'm kind of curious. Do tanks do the same thing? I know they did that in Brood War. In Brood War, I'm pretty sure the turret tracked. Yeah, it does track. So that's, like, a little bit of micro potential. But you can see how easily it destroys tanks. You can see how easily it destroys Thors. 
and then just a couple units. This is without you even, like, necessarily focus firing. <sighs> if I can start with it not focus firing, that is. You can see how much damage it is, and that's without, like, you know, zealots in the mix, too. Look how much easier it is with just a few units tanking damage, or just going through. And what you can do is you can send these in first, just to draw aggro, and then voila, your immortals are barely even taking any fucking damage while you're doing it. Which is why zealots are really good for, like, face tanking damage. And of course, like, archons as well. And I would recommend making them in general in the mid-game, regardless of what race you're playing against. Don't make too many of them unless you see a lot of armored units, though. Like, if you're playing against Terran, don't make too many of them. You should focus on Archons and Zealots. If you're fighting against Zerg and you see, like, Ling Hydra, don't make too many of them. Unless you see, like, a shitload of Roaches or Ultras or something like that. Um, Dark Templar, mostly a harass unit. You can kind of use it to, like, put in cheesy damage in a fight in the mid-game, but I don't recommend doing that. Because, like, one detection wastes all of it. Um, one interesting side note between, like, the Dark Templar and the High Templar. They both can morph into Archons, in case you didn't know, which should be common knowledge, but... The thing is... And they are the same one. It's not like Brood War, where you get a Dark Archon and a regular Archon. The difference is the High Templar is cheaper in minerals, more expensive in gas. And the DT is slightly cheaper in gas. So like, if you want to be more conservative about your gas and you want to make Archons and you don't mind using up more minerals, like, Dark Archons can be a decent choice. A lot of Protoss players like to like open up Archon against Zerg and do Archon drops with them specifically, instead of getting High Templar, because it's a little bit cheaper on gas. I don't personally do drop attacks with Archons, so I can't really attest to that too much. But honestly, for our purposes, we're not going to focus too much on Harass anyway, although I will point out some interesting little details about Harass, because mostly I want to focus on how it generally interacts with units. And, let's see, Dark Templar deal 45 damage. I don't yeah, I think they dealt like 50 or something in Brood War, didn't they? Or maybe it was 40. It's been a while. But, the point is, they one-shot lings. They one- let's see. Do they one-shot... SCVs? Because I believe they two-shot SCVs, if I recall correctly. Oh, it's one! Okay, I must be thinking of Brood War then. You know, remember SCVs are actually a little bit tankier than Brood War. And they do have the ability to blink. Not really that useful, though. It is a separate blink. Like, it's not this blink that you get from the Twilight Council. It's Shadow Stride. Which is kind of confusing, but... There you go. It's just like Stalker Blink. So if you really want to harass, you could do that. Uh, you could potentially use it to... Let's see. Let's say... What you can do is, like, you attack, and then you can, like, blink on top of the spellcasters. I, I don't do that much, but that is a strategy that you can use with the blink ability. Because they are good assassin units, if you're going for, like, high priority targets. And if I recall correctly, they're actually decent against ultras. Let's see how that works. This is, like, just four, which is not really that much in the mid to late game. Yeah, they deal a lot of damage. In fact, even if you have... Let's see how this is. Let's say it's like late game upgrades, alright? Over... Yeah, this deals flat damage, so it might actually beat out the... Dark Templar here. Because of the splash damage too. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> okay, fuck me, Dark Templar are overpowered. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's actually fucking crazy. And actually, on the topic of... Ultralisk, I believe that's another good purpose of the Archon while we're here is they deal like 47 late game. They're not really that great against ultras. But you can see it deals like decent burst damage. Now compare that to like let's say 15 lings. Look at the destruction. Look at that fucking splash damage and they're super tanky. 
We're not really taking that much damage. We didn't even lose one. You can see it with some Hydras. Of course they can get like out DPS a little bit if they're being focus fired, which is why you want to have Zealots frontlining for them as opposed to the other way around, generally. Because Archons technically deal more damage in terms of burst. They have splash damage. Let's just add five Zealots to that and like a few more Hydras, see how that works. You can like focus fire on clumps if you want to like even out that damage. And that's how that interaction can go. It's not too different with Terran as well. Where you want the Zealots absorbing damage while the Archons go in and deal the splash damage. Uh, it's not always the worst thing ever though to have Zealots doing the damage because they're still pretty good in that respect. And we got Disruptors, which are not good against Terran, unless they're going mech. And even then, like, there's probably a good argument that you shouldn't do that. First of all, weird interaction with this ability. If you've never seen a Disruptor, you're not too familiar with it. It's basically this game's equivalent of a, re a Reaver, but it's a little bit more awkward to control. Well, in a sense. It's faster, and it doesn't quite have to be picked around in a warp prism all day, but... First of all... Okay... Let's get Psionic Storm, just to demonstrate. I don't know why I did that. Here is a High Templar, you can see the range clearly. Let's click outside of it. See, he walked over and did it. Now let's see how this works. It does that instead. Now the thing is, if it lands, it can deal a lot of damage. But... When you're doing it against, like, super fast units like Marines, they can just move around it, you know? And you can see the cooldown is 16 seconds, which is quite significant. Actually, I think it's a little bit... Yeah, it's 21 seconds, actually. And it does deal friendly fire damage, by the way, which is something I really need to address. However, it does not damage itself. Only other Protoss units. And it does affect structures, which I actually did not know for a long time. I wouldn't use them against structures. Like, their strength is like clearing out numbers of units. But, if you want to, there's that. Now let's see how good they are against the siege tanks. Because they deal like 145 and some extra damage to like shields. You can see how much burst damage that is. I think this is a good example. Let's get uh, Cyclones. So yeah, I want to try to demonstrate the micro. I'm pretty sure that the... This Nova can follow them. I'm not sure. It's kind of hard to do, honestly, because I'm doing this by myself. But I'm pretty sure, because this is pretty fast, as you can see. I wish it, like, gave you a speed stat on the ball, but it is what it is. Let's check that, okay? Let's try to race. Yeah, it actually looks like it, it's a little bit faster than the Cyclone, actually. You can see when it actually does go off, it can completely one-shot them. So great against Mech. In, you know, combination with Zealots, Archons, and uh, some Immortals. But against Bio and, like, Super fast units in general, not so great. It's good against Hydras, it's good against Roaches. Zerglings, completely destroy it. Against Zerglings, what you want is like Archon Zealot, or you can do is like, you can get some Colossi. And usually, you should have the Thermal Lance upgrade, which is actually, I believe it's cheaper than it used to be. In Hurry of the Swarm, I'm not sure. But anyway, since, uh, Ling Baneling is apparently the go-to thing against fucking Protoss now, I guess I might as well address that. Let's just say you want to, like, kite them out, right? See, they're not terrible at, like, mowing down their units. The light units. But you don't want too many of them, like in Heart of the Swarm, where it just gets better and better the more you have. 
I would say like three or four, maybe five at the absolute worst is decent. Let's say five, all right? And get some hydras and see how it works. Yeah, see, not useless against light units. That's pretty much where their worth goes away. So you don't want to rely on, in terms of splash damage, you want to rely on High Templar. I would say that's the most important thing. Because it's good general damage, you know? But when they're supporting your other units, it can be quite good. And obviously, I would say Colossi are a lot easier to counter. Because, you know, Vipers can walk up and do this fucking shit. Whereas, if you try to, like, catch a... Let's see, what is the range on this? It doesn't say. It's Q, that's, that's range right there. It looks to be about the same range. But let's see the difference. If you want to abduct a High Templar or a Zerg, this is how it works. You can see it's instantaneous and takes away all the mana. Whereas the Viper has to go through this animation. However, I'm actually curious how this works. Let's say I want to abduct this, and I get off the animation. You can still do the feedback after the fact, and obviously if you have full mana... You can just get sniped, I'm pretty sure. Well, not quite. I thought that dealt damage, like full damage. Okay, it's like half the damage, so it gets really close at sniping them. And also, another thing about the Colossus is it does get affected by this, which is really fucking annoying. And it affects only air units, but still. Or, of course, they can do this. It's like classic Wings of Liberty shit. They just focus fire and you're fucking done, kiddo. It happens quite fast. I only have 15. Like, imagine if I have, I think, 20? Let's see if 20 can one-shot him. It's very close to one-shotting it, but not quite. I guess 21 is what it would take to, like, one-shot a Colossus. Yeah. And that's why, like, you can have Archons that can, like, fend off the Corruptors. And, like, maybe some, um... Did you see how this works? You see I'm just focused firing on these guys? See, they get weak, but they're still able to take down the Colossi. There's a perfect example why you don't want to over-rely on them compared to High Templar. And while Psionic Storm is not great against Roaches, or armored units in general. They're a little bit better than Colossi. Uh, like, let's just see how many Psionic Storms it takes to kill, like, one thing of roaches, alright? It's one, and two. Yeah, just two Psionic Storms. And of course, like, Against Zerg, you usually want to have, like, some Immortals anyway when you see Roaches and Stalkers. So, like, it, it goes through quick, you know? Add in a few more. So, like, even if Storm isn't necessarily designed for dealing with Roaches, it still gives you a lot of utility against them. Compared to, let, let's just get the Colossi now. Like, if Zerg just makes a lot more roaches here, he can just walk up and, like, snipe. Actually, I should get rope speed for this test. So you can just walk up and snipe him right there. I don't think I had enough roaches. So, like, I guess in low numbers, like, Colossi aren't awful against roaches, but when there's a decent number of them out, you don't really want to fuck with that too much. And let's see, like, how long it takes a Colossus to kill one roach. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That took nine shots. One, two, three, four, five. That's still five volleys just to take down one roach, you know? Compared to just doing this. Now this is assuming you're not like inefficient with the storm and you like overlap it unnecessarily and you're like spamming it. Just two and that's it. It takes a bit but if Zerg is just standing in place and he's not trying to dodge which a lot of people in bronze and silver won't. There you go. Also I forgot to mention this. I should have brought it up. Um, let's get rid of these. Let's see, the range on this is 8. Stalker has a range of 6. Okay, this doesn't say the range, which is fucking annoying. But the point is... Disruptors are good against... Lurkers as well. Because you can just get like 2 of them and just immediately blow them up like that. In fact, let's see how they fare with the late game upgrade on the lurkers. Yeah, they still outrange the lurkers with their their bomb. And we can still get two, even if the angle is a little bit awkward. Because, like, the, the burst damage, the AoE is still effective. So, if you're trying to break, like, a Lurker line, that's decent. Um, let's say you have High Templar instead. Now, late game upgrade-wise... Yeah, the Lurkers definitely have the High Templar beat in the range department. But let's get rid of that range upgrade, because honestly, you're rarely going to fucking see it anyway. In my experience. Okay, that's two. Right there. You can see it takes like three, and you can actually dodge the spines, which I, I, didn't, mess, I didn't mention that. It's a little awkward with High Templar because they're not really that fast, but... You can see we're dodging some spines. Let, let me get a faster unit for this. Does this guy have charge? Yes, he does. It's kind of fun to dick around with the units, really. You can do this with Marines as well, I'm pretty sure. This was a trick you could do in Brood War. Um... If you're against, like, a small number of lurkers, you can kind of do this and, like, fuck around. Against, like, a significant amount of lurkers, this trick doesn't really matter. Oh, wait, I need an observer. <laughs> so, what you can do is, like, send one of these guys out. Just ahead. And then he can, like, bait out the shots. And take zero damage. Not even, like, baiting towards the direction of the other zealots. Now, obviously, when there's, like, more lurkers on the field, eventually it gets to a point where you can't really dodge anymore. Like, let's just get three. I'm gonna try to dodge. See, it's not as consistent, because, like, now the hitbox on the spines is so wide. It's pretty much impossible. Now, let's see, what are some other interactions? Oh, yeah, Void Rays. I, <laughs> I mean, I guess we can talk about these units. I don't really want to talk about these units, but I guess we can talk about these units. So. Okay. Let me see. Um, let's get... Hatchery here. So, I want to build some... Of these babies. <clears throat> so like first... Oh my god, why did I do that? Well, let's just start it. Now, this deals extra damage to... Well, it's supposed to deal extra damage to structures. Okay, it's actually an upgrade you have to get. But regardless, you can outrange these. Like even if you don't have that much damage. 
when you do have the upgrade going, which is... I've never gotten it, so I don't know what it looks like. Wait, is it not... It has to be on here, right? I don't see it. It's very bizarre. Okay, well, I guess I can't demonstrate it here, but basically, you can break turtles with the Tempest. You can, like, take down Ultralisks. Let's get, like, two Tempests here to show off the damage. Usually what they're designed for is, like, dealing with Brood Lords or Ultras or, or Battle Cruisers or big, like, tanky units like that. They have the massive tag. And <clears throat> as far as carriers go... You can use the interceptors to like confuse the AI on units and force them to like focus you down. But I think you, I believe they buff the leash range. Let's see how far it can go. Yeah, it's pretty decent range. Because you can keep them out of harm's way, assuming there's no vipers around or, you know, Zerg has enough corruptors or Terran has enough vikings to just kind of hurt derp his way to killing you. As far as Void Rays go, I don't really make them. They're good against, like, I believe Vikings are armored. Yeah, they're armored. So you can, like, use these. Activate the Prismatic Alignment. You got good old-fashioned A move. Not great against Mutas, although eventually they get to a number. The thing about Void Rays is, like, they're a huge new bait unit, just like Carriers. Because you see them, and you're like, oh my god, big capital ship, it's so cool. I'm gonna make a million of them and build nothing else the entire game. And then you die. You're like, that's bullshit. That's bullshit, right there. I don't recommend making them in general, unless you have a very, very good reason to do that. They're okay against Thors, but even then, like, I'm pretty sure. Let's get two. Let's make it a little bit more fair. So, Thors have this high impact payload. Let's see how it fares. Okay, and it doesn't deal... Yeah, they're still pretty decent, but at a certain point... If there's enough Thors out. Let's see if they're even in number. You can see how easily they're, like, breaking them down. And that's when they're, like, focus firing, too. So what you want for that situation is, like, a Tempest, you know? And these aren't even... Oh, wait, they do count as armor. Okay. I guess that's why they're taking bonus damage. I don't really go Sky Toss much, so I can't really say too much about it, honestly. I guess we'll talk about the Oracle as well while we're at it. And the Mothership Core. Mothership Core is obviously, like, super nerfed. It has time work, it can, like, turn units invisible, air units, ground units, and I believe structures... Let's see. Yeah, it does do that. It's like a huge capital ship, big target for your opponent to take down. Doesn't come with Vortex, unfortunately. You can recall units to it directly after a while, so if it gets caught out of position or you want to get reinforcements nearby real quick, it's like a good death ball unit. And you got time warp, and especially if you have like High Templar helping out. Let's get some of these. You can deal a ton of damage to the Overseers immediately, and then the only thing that can really hit is the, uh, you can't quite one-shot him. I could have sworn you were able to do that at one point. But I guess I nerfed it. But anyways, as long as they don't have detection, they're just kind of boned when you attack them with a mothership. It's pretty bullshit, late game. And, okay, yeah, last unit I think I really need to address here is the Oracle. Mostly just for harass. You can put down mines, whatever. Um, don't build. I do not recommend building oracles just for the stasis ward. Okay, if you're doing, like, a harass build and using the pulsar being to, like, take down units real quick, like, and you have leftover mana, you can do that. 
use revelation. But you're pretty much only building oracles for the harass, and that's it. Don't build them for the utility, because they're just not worth it in the utility department. They're super awkward, and the gas you spend on the Stargate just for mines and just for revelation would be better spent on just regular units, you know? More like core units for Protoss. It's been long-winded, but I hope this gives you guys like a, a decent idea of like how these interactions work out. Widow mines destroy zealots, they destroy stalkers as well. It's like blink together as a group. So if there's like two widow mines, imagine that damage. Especially if it's like perfected. So that can be good at like softening up the army for like marines and leftover marauders and stuff like that or tanks. Just walk around. Again, really good at softening up the army. Doesn't quite one-shot armies like it does with Zerg. But something you gotta be wary about if you're making a lot of zealots. Especially against a mech player. Some people do bio mine, but it's pretty rare. I think that about covers it as far as that goes. And the general interactions. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh yeah, you can use stalkers to like deny banshees as well. In fact, I'm pretty sure they're... Okay, they're light, but still. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I can talk about... Phoenixes. Phoenixes are good against like light units. In fact, I don't think they're awful against... Vikings. You can like kind of micro them together. They have decent DPS, but you still would rather have Vike, uh, Void Rays. Although, if you get the upgrade... See, they're perfect for, like... You mostly get Phoenix for dealing with Mutalisks, in my experience. Let's just get five Mutas, just to demonstrate. Because you can, like, out-micro them, especially when you have the, um... range upgrade. And now it's not even fair anymore. And wow, you actually get a visual graphic. Is that new? I don't remember that. It's cool. But yeah, of course you can use Graviton being the like pickup units. It doesn't work on massive units though. See, I can't pick up the Ultralisks or anything. And one more thing. We got Guardian Shield on the sentries. Sentries are just for utility. Don't make them just for damage. And don't make too many of them. Um, even against Zerg, you're better off making like more Stalkers or... It, it depends on the map, really. Like some, sh some maps are better for force field use. But if you're on like super open maps... Without a lot of choke points, it could be pretty bad, pretty awkward. That isn't to say it's impossible to get value out of sentries like that, but still. And yeah, massive units break it, even your own massive units, as well as corrosive bile. But since sentries aren't really made that often anymore against Zerg, I feel like it's not an in interaction you're going to see too much. Guardian Shield is okay, and of course you can, like, do this to scout if you happen to have any sentries made and you don't feel like you're going to need them anytime soon and you really want to know what your opponent is doing. There you go. And carriers are very interesting units against Zerg. Because the thing is, like... They're pretty good against light units like Hydras. Especially if they're not like focused firing or anything like that. Let's just have them focus firing now. Just to, like, see how it plays out. Because when the carriers reach a certain critical number, like, it gets closer and closer and closer. And this is without any supporting units. Like, imagine... Like, <laughs> let's just add in two zealots to this and see what difference it makes. They're able to win just off of that. Imagine a lot more zealots tanking the front of the damage. And, of course, you might see some Zerg units, Zerg players get the Microbial Shroud, which can allow 
see, I got 10 carriers. Let's get 15. Okay, just mass carrier dink me. And then 30 hiders. Let's see how it goes. Let's see how different this plays out with this buff enabled. Well, actually, I still have the... Yeah, I had the Zealots there. But you can see, like, even with my Probial Shroud, once it gets to a certain number, the Interceptors just destroy Hydras. And even Corruptors, too. So, I guess there is some validity to getting mass carriers in some instances, but the problem is, like, you run the risk of dying, you know? And you're letting Zerg take the rest of the map, which could be pretty dangerous if he knows what he's doing. Uh, usually what Zerg players will do is they'll get Vipers and, like, pick you apart little by little if they're competent. But I just don't think it's a good habit because it always feels cheesy to get mass carriers. I don't know, maybe I should experiment more with Sky Toss styles. It's not really a style I'm too familiar with. I'm more of, like, a gateway robo, uh, council, Twilight Council kind of player. Templar. And yeah, I think that about covers it, as far as, like, the main interactions goes. I don't think there's anything else. Uh, don't underestimate Zealots against... Don't underestimate Hellbats against Zealots, because they will kick their asses. You can see how easily they get softened up. Uh, zealots can still trade decently. However, see how it is when they do have Blue Flame. Yeah, it's a lot closer. Imagine supporting units like tanks or Thors with that, too. I think that actually covers it. Um, ravens aren't really something you see often. Banshees you typically only see in, like, pressure builds. And I guess some Terrans might go, like, Battlecruiser Rush. I'm not sure. I know I see them a lot as a Zerg player, but... I don't know how common it is against Protoss. I imagine it's not very common. The thing is, like... Let's get, like, one Battlecruiser and, like... 10 stalkers and see how it goes. So like their DPS is decent and I'm sure when it gets to a critical number. Like it gets less and less efficient. So like don't assume that stalkers alone will beat battle cruisers if you do see them, because you definitely want some tempests, even if it's just like one. So it adds so much extra damage, you know? Imagine more than one, too. In fact, even... I'm pretty sure Void Rays are good against them as well. Yeah, they're armored. So it should work. Yeah. And let's see how Archons work against them. Yeah, they add a little bit extra damage. They're not awful to rely on. Um, they don't use energy anymore. They're entirely, like, cooldown reliant, and they can tactical jump away, so be wary of that. Wary of, like, Battlecruiser harass, etc. And the amount of cannon can help quite a bit, too. And I think that's about it. Oh, yeah, don't fight in the zone, generally speaking. If you see a lot of this, try to snipe it, like, outside of the range. Or you can use, like, some Archons to snipe it or blink around it, you know? Or what you can do is get some Tempest to snipe them. You don't worry. You don't really have to worry about the, uh, regular air attack from them, though. And now I think that's about it. And hopefully this gives you a decent idea of, like, where to begin understanding how unit interactions work. And next episode, we're going to be going over builds and, like, how to spend your money, how the basic fundamentals of the game work, and how to, like, adapt. Peace. <laughs>